We now have 10 people waiting on the stream already, so that's gradually ramping up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I guess that it's night time in the in the United States. So yeah, yeah, in, yeah. In the US, that's going to be difficult, but that's that's yeah. why we do the recording as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm, I'm just going to go live now. We hit ten o'clock, so on yeah. the stream. Okay. Okay, the live stream is up. We'll give it one or two more minutes before actually starting the talk. Just let people. Let people join in. Just again, for the people on the stream, we'll get started. Well, now it's two past the hour. Okay. So I would like to welcome Rui Uyama, um, the developer of the mold uh, linker, a modern linker. Um, so Rui is an independent software developer who used to work at Google and who got recently got a master's degree in computer science at Stanford University. Um, he's also the original developer of the LLVM LLD linker, and he has now started working on a, a new implementation, a new linker that's called MOLD. So go ahead, Rui. Yeah, thank you for introducing me. So I, my name is Rui Uyama. Can, can, you see, can you see my face on the screen? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, so today I am going to give a talk about my new linker, whose name is MOLD which is obviously just a joke name, but it's back to named to modern linker because LD is a linker's command name. So, um, so here is a overview of today's talk. So this is going to be 45 minutes um, presentation followed by 15 minutes uh, Q and a session. So I don't think that I can cover a lot of stuff during this talk. Uh, but so in the first of half of the talk, I will be focusing on what the linker is because people do not really understand the actual job that the linker is doing. Um, and in the rest of the talk, I will be giving an idea, high level idea as to why mode is so fast, faster than the other linkers. And lastly, I will give you some ideas as to how to write a faster program in general. So 
<clears throat> Who am I? So my name is Rui Uyama. I'm a full-time independent developer since 2020. So, and before that, I was working for Google for 10 years. And, and at there, I was in uh, the compiler team. And specifically, I was working for LLVM. And I was creating LLD linker. I'm the original creator of the linker. And, um, and I left the company. And then I started a new project called Mold. And I've been working on that project for almost two years. So, uh, and besides that, I have a few other open source projects, like a small C compiler called Chibishishi. So if you are interested, please visit my GitHub page to see what's, what I did in the open source world. And, uh, <clears throat> and, and uh, since I'm an open source developer, I don't have any revenue so far. So if you are happy with my product, then please consider supporting my project via GitHub sponsors or, I, or making a commercial support contact with me so that I can help you guys to introduce initial introduction of the motor linker to your organization. And I think that we can also fix bugs for you. So status of the project, how much useful the mode linker is. So it's, so for Unix or Linux, the mold linker is actually production ready and used by a lot of um, projects and in many organizations. And the, and the reason why people wanted to use the non-standard linker instead of the standard one is because mold linker is extremely fast. It's, it's so fast, but I will talk about it later. And the, so these days, I'm actively working on mode linker for macOS or more specifically, Apple operating systems such as iOS, watchOS, and of course, macOS. And it's pre-alpha, but its performance is pretty, looks pretty promising. Um, so even though it's not the general use, I think that it's going to be an interesting project. So. Yeah, if you are working on macOS or iOS, stay tuned. And after I finish macOS version of Mold, I will. I have a plan to work on macOS uh, Windows version of Mold, so that we will be covering all the major platforms using the single linker. And all of them, and these linkers are just a drop-in replacement for the existing linkers. So you can, you don't have to change the command line other than the command name itself to use the motor linker um, instead of the default one. <laughs> so what is linker? What the linker is doing in, in the build system? So linkers, seems to be a complicated piece of program because it has a lot of features and a lot of command line options. But the fundamental concept of the linker is, is actually pretty simple. So what it does is, so if you are writing a program in the compiled language like C, C++ or Rust, the compilation or build step consists of two stages. In the first stage, you compile individual source files, individual source file into an object file, which usually have .o file extension. And then in the second stage, you combine all .o files into a single executable or the shared object file. So, and even if your program consists of a single source file, chances are you are linking that object file to, uh, to the standard library. So even if, you are, even if you, your program consists of a single file, you are still using the linker. So you are using 
tinkers every day or every command invocation. <laughs> so the to in order to understand how important or how, how fundamental the idea of Dinker is. So this is a quote from the Dinkers and Roders book uh, published in 1999. So according to the book, the very idea of the Dinker is was mentioned in 1947, which is only two years after the digital computer is invented. And the um, and in that memo, uh, a small program that combines pro a pieces of of machine code into a single program was mentioned. So, and if you think of, of it, 1947 is a year even before the assembler was created. So the Dinka would be a program that you wanna write after inventing the computer program, even before writing the assembler for that computer. And, and that's understandable because after inventing the digital computer, chances are you are writing code in hex code, but you, you are writing some subroutines like sorting routine in machine code. And you wanna reuse that piece of code in many programs. So naturally you wanna write a program that combines pieces of fragments of program into a single program. So where are you uh, invoking the linker in the usual uh, build process? So here is the example command line of the of the build system, which is actually building the mold linker. So because the linker takes all object files, it usually invokes at the very last step of the build. In this case, it's the uh, emphasize the line of the command line invocations. So the linker's command name is usually LD, which is usually installed under bin slash, uh, user slash bin. But uh, it is not that, uh, you, you don't usually invoke LD directly from the command line, but instead you invoke it via CC or GCC or Clang or Clang++, plus plus, whatever of the, your choice of the compiler. So you are usually thinking that CC or GCC is a compiler name, but it's actually the compiler's front end name. And that front end invokes the appropriate back end command based on the given file names uh, extensions. So if you pass dot all files to the compiler driver, then it invokes LD. So this is how you invoke the linker. So you can see the actual command line name of the LD uh, command by appending hyphen triple hashes to the compiler driver. So in this case, we are compiling Hello World program into a single program. And uh, I'm appending hash, hash, hash to Clang. And it prints out the ex uh, actual command line invocation of the LD. So the um, compiler driver adds a lot of uh, command line arguments to LD, like hyphen G, or whatever. And it also passes a lot of uh, file names like CRT1 or CRT whatever. And these are implicitly linked to your program because they are startup routine and shutdown routines that needs to be linked to every program. And the, uh, the compiler driver also passes the directory names in which the standard library is uh, stored like user being div or whatever. So, and the compiler knows the, the structure, directory structure of the system. So it passes all the necessary command line options to the, to the linker. 
And uh, if you have any question, uh, please interrupt me anytime so that I can answer. So <laughs> here is a here is a question: Why do we need a linker? I mean, why do, can't you make the compiler to directly emit the entire complete program instead of a fragment of the program? And the answer is, well, we can actually do that. We can actually make the compiler to emit a complete program. But in order to do that, you have to pass all source code to the compiler, including standard libraries. And sometimes, like, if you are building web browser, the, the amount of source code is in the order of tens of millions of lines of code. So it's not practical to compile all code every time you make a single line change to the source code. And it, it is also just a waste of time to compile the same function again and again every time you invoke the uh, compiler. So for example, if you are using printf, then you don't want to waste the time to compile printf function every time you use printf because printf function is, is, is the same function. So you just compile once and link to all programs that needs printf. So, <clears throat> so the, the idea of separating compilation from linking is called separate compilation. So in order to understand why, what, what the linker is doing, you, you first have to understand the, what's, the, what's inside the executable and how it is in, um, executed in, in the computer, on the computer. So this is a very simpli simplified diagram of the executable file and its memory image for executed, being executed on the computer. So essentially, the executable contains initialized data, which is essentially in a global variables with initial values, along with the machine code, which should be able to be executed when mapped to memory. And a, a little bit of terminology. So in this context, text doesn't mean ASCII string. Uh, take it, in this context, a text means machine text or machine instructions. So it's, uh, it's machine instructions. So text segment contains machine, machine instructions and the data segment contains um, initialized data. And they are mapped to memory when being executed. And the OS kernel initializes, initializes um, stack area, which contains local variables, usually to the very top of the memory address space, and then jump to the middle of the text segment to start executing the program. So it's a very simplified picture, but it's a, it's a, yeah, essential idea, fundamental idea of what's going on. So how is the um, executable file created? So object files and executable files are kind of similar. So object files also contain data it's not a really segment, but object file contains data and the code in, in a separate sections. And uh, the linker combines them individually and, uh, and, and concatenates them to construct an executable file. So <clears throat> what's in an object file? So here is the, so I'm gonna explain it. So here is the um, compile, what, so if you compile a small piece of program that is shown on the left hand side of this slide to the assembly, you will get something like the 
assembly on the right hand side. And um, so this is a Hello World program. Uh, it prints out a constant string to the standard output. So take a look at the assembly output. So if you carefully take a look at it, you would notice that uh, there is similarities between the C program and its compiled assembly. So assembly contains um, literal string as it is, and it also contains function call from the fourth line from the bottom, call printf. So it kind of preserves the original uh, structure of the program. So function call is still function call in assembly. And, but uh, assembly text is not something that in, in the object file. What's inside of object file is actually in a machine code, which is not readable to humans, but we can disassemble it so that uh, to display it as a assembly. So this is a picture of disassemble output of the same function. And since assembly is a very, assembly is a language that's very close to the um, machine code, disassembling it is kind of one-to-one one one operation, but uh, not all information can be store, restored from the compiled, compiled code. So take a look at the uh, call instruction in the executable. Uh, object file. So here is a here is a line to call print a function. So e8 is a is x86 opcode to make a function call, which should be followed by four bytes displacement to the to the location where we want to jump next. So the four byte offset has to be filled with the relative, uh, re relative location from this very instruction to the beginning of the printed function in memory. But the problem here is that uh, the compiler doesn't know where the printed function is at runtime when we compile source code. So we include a header file, but it only tells the compiler of the existence of the function and the type of the function, but it doesn't tell you where the function is at runtime. So the compiler cannot fill that value. So it has no choice other than leave it at zero. But instead, so it leaves an, a, piece of inf a piece of information in an object file saying that fix these four byte value uh, with the relative relative distance to the printer function. And that kind of information is called relocation. So, so the linker when combining object files interprets relocation records to fix offsets. It's essentially by binary patching object files created by um, compiler to make a complete program. So based on that understanding, here is a basic picture of what the linker is doing. So linker does combine object files into a single file and then applying relocations so that inter object file references are correctly referring to the right place. So, and this is, this is, a, this is actually the fundamental understanding of the um, linker. And everything else is secondary. That being said, there are a bunch of features that Linker has to deal with to link real world program. And, and notably, Linker usually have to handle uh, libraries, like the standard libraries or the a third party library or a library you wrote for yourself. Um, so let me explain it. So 
there are two types of libraries, static and dynamic. So I will give an explanation of my static library first. So what is static library? So static library is, uh, is just a bundle of object files, which usually has .a file extension. And the file is actually just a bundle of object files, just like zip or tar. There is no technical reason not to use zip or tar, but historically we are using dedicated file format, uh, which is usually called just archive file um, format. So you can peek inside of archive file using AR command, uh, just as shown on this slide. Uh, ART is a command to uh, print out the file names inside an archive file. And on this slide, we are displaying the contents of the libc static library. And it has contains a lot of object, object files. So it's actually contain, it, the libc actually contains um, an object file for each public function. So it contains, for example, printf. .o or vf printf. .o for printf and vf printf. So they are separated into their own object file. So <clears throat> why they are separated? Uh, it's why can't we make a single object file that contains all DVC functions? Well, we can. But if we do, by default, the linker links the entire object file into the output file. So, which means that you always link the entire libc. That's a huge waste of space, right? Because you don't usually use all the functions of libc, but just a fraction of it. So, for that reason, libc's source code is separated for each function and then each function is compiled into their own object file and then bundled as an archive file and in that way you can save a lot of space but uh, you don't you don't want to specify which object file to link because you don't really know which files are needed for your program so that uh, that part is automated. So if you give an archive file, a static archive, I mean static library to the linker, then here is what the linker is that uh, here is what the linker does. So linker reads symbols from object files in an archive and then pulls out object files that's needed to complete your program. So it automatically fills the gap of, of your program by filling the missing symbols. <coughs> and that's exactly what you expect from the linker. So what's the advantage of the linker? Uh, static linking. So well, it's first of all, pretty simple. It's just a bundle of object files. And once object files are pulled out from archives, then it's just linked. So it's simple. And the other uh, benefit of um, static library is that uh, the library's code is directly copied to your executable. So your executable is self-contained. So for example, if you completely static link your executable, then you can just copy that executable to other machine to install your program. You don't have to copy any other files. But there are disadvantages of doing this. So, well, first of all, a du du duplicate copies of the same functions are copied into many um, executables. And the other uh, disadvantage is that if you wanna 
update a function for some security reason or something, then you have to relink all executable that linked against that executable, uh, uh, linked against that library. So there is another style of the um, library, which is dynamic library. So I'm going to explain it. So dynamic library is a separate file. And the file is loaded to memory along with your executable and other dynamic libraries. So the, 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 the pros and the cons of dynamic library is opposite to the static library. So advantages are you don't have to copy the same function bodies into many different executables because you only have to run, have a single copy of shared object file. And updating the shared object file is very, very easy because you only have to replace that shared object file. Then, yeah, you can, then everything else will be updated. But there is, of course, a disadvantage of, of this mechanism. So first, it's complicated. It's much more complicated than um, a simple static library. And there is, there is an overhead of process startup time because just loading a dynamic library along a, a side by side with your executable is not enough to make it executable in memory. You have to fix some uh, places to combine them in memory. So there is some work on process startup, so which makes process startup a little bit slower. And, uh, and the other issue is that, so historically, Windows has a issue with DLL hell, which is if you replace non shared library, with the newer version and the newer version behavior is slightly different from the previous version. Or if your previous version of, if your executable depends on the buggy behavior of the previous version, then your executable stops working even if you are not touching the executable file itself. <clears throat> so how is dynamic library implemented? So, <clears throat> After loading two files into memory, you have to fix a little bit of data and the code so that uh, the inter file differences are correctly pointing to the right places. So for example, let's say you, you are linking against dynamic library version of DBC and you are using printf function in your program. Then after loading your program into memory, you, you have to fix up the machine instructions of call uh, printf because that the, the exact location of printf is not uh, determined until you actually load libc into memory. Uh, so you have to fix them at runtime, just like we did uh, for static linking on file. But there is a problem of um, naively applying that approach. So if you are fixing a function calls directory, then you essentially have to uh, mutate all pages of your program because you have to, for example, you, if you are if you want to fix all locations of printf call, then chances are there are thousands of printf function calls and you don't want to fix thousands of places in your program because it slows down your program loading and it also breaks physical page sharing. So there is a trick of uh, circumventing some the problem. So, well, there is a, all problem can be resolved 
by introducing one more uh, indirection. So in this case, we create two special sections called um, GOT and PLT. And we let the, all the external references through GOT or PLT. So for example, PLT, if you, your program has printf function call, then PLT has an entry for printf and all printf calls jumps to PLT first. And the relative, relative location between your text segment and the PLT segment in the same file are always fixed wherever the image is loaded. So it, you don't have to fix a location of printf call. So you only have to fix a PLT entry. So it significantly reduces the amount of data you have to fix for dynamic linking. So in order to do that, so GOT and PLT are created by linkers. And you don't have to create GOT and PLT if they are not external references. So you have to scan relocations first um, to, to fix the uh, contents of PLT and the code, and then apply relocations in the linker. So this is a tricky part because you, you have to do this first. This, this has to be two, step, two steps because you, in order to fix the file layout or memory layout of the executable, you have to know the exact size of GOT and the PLT. But you, know, you don't know the exact size of PLT and the GOT until you scan relocations. So you scan relocations first to determine the size of GOT and the PLT so that you can fix the file layout and then apply relocations by scanning the relocations again. So here is a summary of, uh, of the talk I gave so far. So this is what the link has to do. So it reads object files, read symbols, and scan relocations to determine the size of PLT and the code. And then once we fix the file layout, we can copy data from input object file to output executable while we are applying relocations. So that was the overview of what the linker is doing. So this is going to be the second part of the talk, uh, which is uh, specific to mode. So why does the linker speed matter in the first place? Well, because faster is always better. <laughs> so, I mean, linking is still the, one of the slowest step of the build, especially if you are building the program from, from scratch, chances are the entire build time is dominated by compiling, not linking. But if you are doing incremental linking, I mean, if you, modify only in a file and then build again, then the compiler compiles only in a file and then linker invokes, linker is invoked to recreate an executable. So the second part takes sometimes more than 10 seconds or minutes or even more. And that's, that's very important because that's an interactive session that in which you are actively writing code you are in front of an IDE or editor. So if you are, if we can save, say 27 seconds for each build, it's not only saving 27 seconds, it keeps you maintain focus, which is very important because, well, if it takes 30 seconds, you would switch a browser to the browser and start web browsing. But if it takes only two seconds, then you can just wait. <coughs> so this is the fun part. How fast uh, is mold? It's extremely fast. So this is a graph of gold, GNU gold 
LLVM LLD, which I originally created a few years ago, and the old linker. And the default linker is not GNU Gold. The default linker on Unix, on Linux is GNU LD, but I omit these numbers from this graph because it's too slow. Um, so, mold is sometimes more than 10 times faster than the other linkers. So, roughly speaking, you can expect that on a high core count modern x86 machine, like 10 core or 16 core machine, you can expect that mold throughput is one gigabyte per second. So, if your executable is like two gigabyte, then mold can link it in two seconds, which is a, which is a very easy to understand. So, and it's extremely fast because it's actually only twice as slow as CP, <laughs> copying the executable file to other file on the same machine. So thinking that, considering that the linker is doing more stuff than just copying file contents, it's extremely fast, which probably means that it's almost impossible to create an linker that's significantly faster than mode anymore because it's already almost IO bounded. So why mode, why is mode so fast? What's the secret behind it? So that's a question that I often got and uh, there is no single answer. Uh, so if you improve some existing existing program and get a better number, then you can attribute the speed to the, your change. But if you create something from scratch, then everything is different. And you cannot really break down which contributes how much. But uh, I, I have a few ideas as to why that's so, so fast. So the first thing is that we do not do too much. I mean, we just mmap object files into memory and directly consume data structures on the file. We do not create intermediate representations, representation of the data structures if possible, because well, constructing the internal intermediate representation takes time and memory and taking memory means taking more time to construct that data structure. So we do this. And uh, the other important thing is we parallelize all internal passes of the linker. And that's important because if you partially parallelize the internal pass, you can still speed it up, but not that much because of the Amdahl flow. So let's say half of your program is parallelized then you cannot make it any faster than 2x because the single threaded part is going to be the bottleneck. How, how, how many, no matter how many cores you have. And we have other clever techniques in mold. I'll talk about that later. So here is a visual uh, explanation of the differences of LD and mold. So the, to the left is LOD, and this is the usage of per core CPU usage. So during the execution, LOD consumes, uh, runs only on a single core and sometimes uses all cores. But uh, throughout of its execution, it's mostly single threaded. And that limits the overall speed because of the Amdahl flow. So to the left is the is the same benchmark of mold, and in mold it uses all cores from the beginning of the, to the end. Um, so in this demo, I kept the, the number of cores to sixteen, but it can scale more. <clears throat> so yeah, it's parallelized. It, it's uh, in all internal passes. And it's, it finishes very quickly, as you can see. 
So, so how do we parallelize the internal internals of the linker? So in order to understand that, you have to understand the size of the problem. So the scale here is a, is a list of elements in, um, in, in input object files when you are linking Chrome with debug info, which, whose output size is about two gigabyte. So for example, in total, you have 16 million um, relocations and like more than 10, 20 million of symbols. So you have a very large number of data of the same type, <laughs> sometimes in the order of millions of tens of millions. So we employ the data parallelism in order to parallelize the linker. So data parallelism is a paradigm to process large amount of data of the same type in parallel. So it scales very well because uh, in order to process each individual piece of data, you don't have to um, synchronize to between threads. <laughs> and it's also easier to understand than a program with more compli complicated uh, synchronization mechanism and communication mechanism because data parallelism is essentially in a for loop that happened to be executed in parallel. So besides that, we also use some clever smart uh, data structures for a concurrent programming. Mine is that uh, we use concurrent map, which is implemented in Intel TBB. Intel TBB is a library to support concurrent programming. And I really recommend to, uh, using that library if you are doing uh, concurrent programming. So concurrent ma map is just a map, but uh, it is designed in a way that you can efficiently insert uh, new elements from multiple threads into a single um, map. So we use concurrent map for symbol named resolution. So there is only, there is a, a central uh, hash map which knows all symbol names. And for each object file, we run a thread to read the symbol table and the install symbol names into the concurrent hash map. And since concurrent hash map scales well, we can do that in parallel. And that speeds up a, a lot compared to reading each file individually, sequentially. We also use other in, um, parallelism patterns like map reduce pattern. So here is the example. So if you pass hyphen hyphen build hyphen ID to the linker, then that instructs the linker to compute a crypto hash of the, of the output file and then embed that hash function, a uh, hash value as a signature of, uh, to the output file. So as long as you get uh, the same output file, you get the same signature. So yeah, it, it can be used as a signature. And computing the crypt hash for a large file takes time, like seconds in the order of seconds. So we wanna parallelize it. So here's what we were doing. So we consider the output file as a sequences of small records, like 10 megabytes of records, and we compute SHA hashes for each uh, pieces of data. And then we compute SHA hash of the SHA hashes um, as a signature of the file. So this way we can parallelize the first step. And then since SHA hash is very small, the second step doesn't take too much time. So uh, I think this is a 
no, this is not a, a, a and we use other uh, techniques to speed things up because Mo's point is to make to is a speed. And we use, we are using all techniques that we can use to speed it up. One of the significant diff, one of the changes that made a significant difference is to use alternative malloc function. So GDFC's malloc function function didn't scale well for many cores. So we benchmarked with JE malloc, TBB malloc, TC malloc, and me malloc, which are excellent implementations of malloc function. And then based on the benchmark, we chose me malloc, which is created by Microsoft. That scales best for us. So thank you for Microsoft for creating me malloc and open sourcing it. <clears throat> and the other technique we are using is we noticed that um, writing to now file, existing file that's already in buffer cache is much faster than creating the new file and writing to it. So we overwrite an existing file if it exists, unlike other linkers. The other technique that we use is that, so we notice that um, if we map a lot of uh, input files and the large output file, exit system call takes time, like a few hundred milliseconds. So if we are, if you are aiming one second or two seconds goal, a few mil, a few hundred milliseconds is a huge waste of time. So we organize the linker into two processes. So the first process, the parent process, invokes the child process, and the child process does its job to link the program. And as soon as the, the second child program completes its job, it notifies the parent and then parent exits. And it looks like the exit of the program from the user's point of view. And the child takes time to exit because it's not an inter interactive process. So it's just a trick, but it's effective. So um, I think that I can give a few hints uh, on writing FASA program that's not specific to mold. So this is, I think, the, the last slide of the talk. So the first piece of advice I can give is don't guess measure as, as often said as axioms. So because speculations are usually wrong. So if you optimize based on speculations, you are optimizing code that doesn't really matter. And that's ju not just a waste of your time, but it could complicate your, your program unnecessarily. So don't optimize until it's proved to be optimized. The second piece of advice is that don't try to write faster code. I mean, fast, faster code is important, but you should design your data structures so that it is natural to write faster code. So as Rob Pike said, data is a central piece of the program and the code is around it. I think that, that's a uh, that's correct statement. Um, the third piece of advice is that sometimes you have to write, implement multiple algorithms for the same part of the program and then choose the best one. It's because you cannot make a guess as to what the algorithm will be the best one for your program. So there is sometimes no choice other than just do it and choose the best one. So it's a reality of writing code. And the last piece of advice is the, is the extent of the third one. So sometimes you have to rewrite the entire program just like, just like I did to LRD, LRD and the mold linker. So, so that you, you can learn from the, your implement, your first implementation and with that knowledge, you can write better program on the second and the third iteration. And uh, 
This is sometimes necessary because if you change the fundamental data structure of the program, then you have no choice other than doing everything from scratch. And I don't think that that's totally in a waste of time because writing the same program twice doesn't make take two more times of your time because yeah, second time attempt will be much faster. So it's sometimes worth it. I, I don't recommend it casually, but in reality, you sometimes have to do it. And I think that's the end of my talk. Right, thank you very much, Rui. Uh, I think this was really good, uh, really good focus and technical, but not, not too deep, let's say. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure there's lots of more technical tricks that you pull in mold to, to make it faster, but. Uh, yeah, if you are interested in the, if you are interested in the actual optimizations I made to the mold linker, you should take a look at the source code. It, and I also wrote the design document and, and yeah, saved to GitHub. So, well, please take a look at the source code and the documentation. Yeah. All right. Um, we have, a, I think, a, a bit of a technical question um, from someone watching the stream. So I'll, I'll just okay. read, the, read the question. Do all mm -hmm. calls to a common external symbol share a unique record in the in the PTL and, and GOT tables? So the advantage is there's only one relocation per symbol instead of n relocations. Uh, so, sorry, what? Can you say the beginning part of the question? So do all calls to a common external symbol share a unique record in the PTL and GOT tables? Do all gold? All calls, also all function oh, all calls. calls. Uh, uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, so the, the, you're basically making making those tables so there's uh, a, a unique place to then reference from. Yeah, that, so yeah. you aggregate all function calls into one place before it jumps to external module. Right, yeah, okay. And uh, um, a follow-up question that I had related to that is that you, you mentioned that before you can create those tables, the, the GOT and, and PLT, you need to know how big they are. So you mm -hmm. have to scan all the symbols first. So you know you need to know how much room is needed there. Yeah, that that seems like something that you may be able to win some um, some time on as well. So I'm and I'm not sure if it, if this could ever work. But what if you just make an, an educated guess for the size? Let's say I don't know one megabyte. I don't know if that's sensible, but just to name something. So you you say okay, let's assume it's one megabyte, and it will start filling it. And only when you notice it's not big enough, you you redo things. So I, I think you may end up with a situation where in most cases it's very fast. And in some cases you have to redo some work and that, then it's maybe a little bit slower. Yeah, you can do that. And you can also put the PLT and the code to the end of the file so that it can grow without pushing other stuff uh, down in the memory address space. But uh, there are, so the thing is that the, maybe the shortest answer is that scanning all the location doesn't take too much time. We can do that for Chrome size program in 50, 50 milliseconds or at least less than 100 milliseconds. Yeah. So there is no strong reason not to scan the locations and go proceed and try again or it, so, it wouldn't make much of a difference, I guess. Yeah. No, it, it doesn't. And uh, so we just scan the locations for the sake of simplicity. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. Yeah, it, it, it goes back to, well, one of the hints here on the slides, optimize where it actually makes sense, right? So Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. And there is another issue if you place got and PLT at the end of the section. Because now you have two text sections, one text section for the main executable, and the other text section for for PLT. PLT is a executable piece of code. So, which means that the kernel has to map pages 
twice. And I guess that that incurs some memory pressure if you have tons of processes in a single computer. So yeah. if you can, if it's doable, continuous piece of data is always better than separated piece of data. So yeah, in terms of yeah, caching and things like this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that makes a lot of sense. Okay, but maybe, uh, well, I see other questions coming in, but I'll ask a high level one first. And I'm not sure if it matters, but does does Mold also support linking of object files that, that came from a Fortran compiler? Is that relevant at all? What, what the source programming language is, or is that irrelevant? It does. Uh, I personally didn't try, but obviously people are using Mold to link Fortran programs and common list programs, or and sometimes D, D language, mm -hmm. and of course Rust. So the object file format is essentially the same, or otherwise you cannot link Fortran programs to C++ code. Mm -hmm. So there are some differences of feature set that they are using. So there could be a bug, but uh, so in order to test mold, I built all Gen2 packages using mold. And then I found a few issues with Fortran because Gen2 contains a few Fortran programs. And even though I cannot write or even read Fortran programs, I somehow managed all unit test failures for Fortran programs. So I believe it works. And if it doesn't, please file a bug so that yeah. I can fix. Yeah, for, for us, this may be important because in, in scientific software, there's still quite a bit of Fortran. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. But it, it's good to hear that it's supporting lots of different languages. And it, it sounds like you're not aware of a language where it doesn't work, right? There's You haven't found anything that it's really, it's known not to work at all. Or No, uh, essentially it should work for all languages. No. Well, well, speaking of which, some languages has its own object file format. For example, Go, the, mm -hmm. G, the Go language is so isolated that it has own, own, own set of compiler, the linker, the runtime, and it, its own object file format. So it doesn't work with any other language. And, but uh, I don't think that that matters to you because if you are writing Go, then you must use Go's linker anyways. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have another um, another question coming in. So how easy is it to use or tweak a linker to change the content of a constant string in the data segment of a binary and relocate all the addresses properly? So, and then a the follow-up question, would that even be possible uh, having access only to a binary and not the originating source files? Um, I don't quite get the meaning of the question. So it is. So can can you use or change a linker, uh, use or yeah, use a linker to change the content of a constant string in the data segment of a binary and then relocate uh, everything properly? For what? <laughs> I've been basically rewriting of, yeah, I don't know what the use case is. Yeah, but... um, so rewriting the stuff doesn't, it shouldn't, be, shouldn't hard, be hard. It depends on what you wanna do exactly. But if you wanna rewrite, for example, storing a constant with other string, then you can just hack it up. Uh, so it shouldn't be too hard. So the, it the, all depends on exactly what you want to do. Yeah, and the, the use case is is, is rewriting uh, paths to files on relocation. So I, okay. So um, you, you you basically have a path hard coded. I guess this is with with R path or run path linking. Um, you have a part hard coded in the binary, and you want to you want to change that to something else. I think that that's not too hard, but. Uh, of course, it's not a feature that's 
supported by the standard linker. So mm -hmm. you have to modify the source code of the linker to look up that string and rewrite it. But yeah. the change itself shouldn't be too hard. Okay, yeah. I hope that answers your question. Um, okay, uh, one, one thing that I was thinking about as well, so you're, when the linker glues together these object files and then make sure that linking to a shared library, all of that works nice. There's, there's lots of choices you have to make in terms of how things are laid out in, in memory, right? Are yeah. there also opportunities there for making the actual binary itself faster to load just by putting, um, by puzzling the text, the text segment together differently. So maybe trying to minimize jumps um, between functions or yeah, not go too far in memory. Yeah, there is a, a lot of um, researches in that area. So recently, Facebook donated both BOLT to LLVM. And what that is, is, is to optimize a program uh, so that its memory layout is optimized for better CPU caching. For example, if you, so it's based on profiling. So it runs the program fast and then use the profiling result to optimize the same program further. So if you ident can identify called functions and hot functions of the program, then you, you don't wanna mix them because that's a waste of you know, cache, cache mm -hmm. entries. Yep. So you wanna separate the called functions from hot functions. And also you want to separate hot functions into two functions that often called sequentially next to each other so that they are being cached very well. So there are a lot of research is done in that area. And uh, some linker has a feature to rearrange object files as they are instructed by now command line. Mold doesn't have the feature yet, but uh, we, we eventually have to support that feature. Okay. Um, let's see. I, I have two more questions. If I don't see any others popping up, I'll just raise mine. Um, so yeah, you, you mentioned that a big part of Mold is that all, all the data structures internally are being processed in parallel. So you're, you're using all the available cores and that's a big part of the, the speed. So why is this new for a linker? Like why wasn't this done on LLV? It, 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 it never occurred to you that this did make sense or you didn't see the, the point there were not enough cores maybe back then or? That's a good question. So speaking of GNU linkers, the original GNU linkers, the original GNU linker was written in 1980s, I guess. So it's extremely old, and I don't think that multiple core machines are popular mm -hmm. in that area. GNU Gold is designed to be scale well for multi-threading, multi but it turns out that it didn't scale well in practice for some technical reason. And when I was creating LD, my main focus was to create an linker which is compatible with GNU and the speed was the secondary and it turns out to be much faster than GNU but it wasn't the original goal so if I were aiming to the better performance from the beginning it could have been different but uh, yeah that's uh, I think that's a answer but uh, the other thing is that if I were trying to get a better performance when I was writing LD, I, maybe I couldn't do that because I didn't know very well about the linker and how to optimize it in terms of parallelism. Mm -hmm. So I learned a lot from <coughs> writing LD and then use that knowledge to make it a better one. Yeah, no, that, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Okay. Um... There's one more question coming in, which is quite close to one I had as well. So um, how does mold figure out how many cores it can use? Does it just use everything in view? 
and can you can you limit it as well so can you tell it how many cores it can use rather than using everything it sees so it's automatically recognized by the library which is intel tbb so it by default tries to use all cores so essentially it spawns the same number of threads as the number of cores and then try to parallelize as much as possible. Mm -hmm. But you can limit the number of cores for, for, for the linker. So the link mode takes hyphen, hyphen, thread, hyphen, count, or thread okay. number. I don't remember yep. the exact command line option. But yep. it takes the, the a number as an argument for the command line. Mm -hmm. And if you pass that option, then mode wouldn't start more than the given number of threads. Yep. Okay, excellent. That makes that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. All right. Yeah, the, our, our main worry here is that we, we're often building um, software in a, in a constrained environment like C groups or anything like this, where maybe there are 16 cores available on the system. But for that build, you're only supposed to use four. And then, yeah, yeah I mean, I'm not sure if Intel TBB is aware of that. I would guess it is, but I'm not sure. But if it's not, and we can just tell mold how many threads it can use, then, then that's OK. Yeah, All right. Cool. I think we're running out of questions to ask. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. So I, I, I want to wrap up with thanking you very much for the, the excellent talk. I think the, the level of, of the, yeah, the technical level and the amount of depth was, was perfect. Um, so thank you very much for uh, spending the time to really explain to us what a linker is and what it does. Um, and yeah, all the best of luck um, with, uh, with your work on mold. And again, I just want to echo um, one of the statements you made uh, at the start. You're, you're doing this basically independent. Um, so if people are up for sponsoring you um, to keep working on mold, uh, they should definitely consider that. Uh, so they can take a look at your GitHub page uh, for more information. Yeah, S thank you for inviting me to give the talk. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.